When thinking about television in general, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? Does your mind gravitate towards streaming services like Netflix or Hulu? Or does it have a tendency to veer off to traditional broadcast networks such as ABC, CBS, NBC, or Fox? If you said yes to traditional broadcasting, you might be interested to know that before Fox made its mark on the industry as the fourth major network, there was an original fourth network. That network would come to be known as Dumont, and during its brief 10-year duration on air, it helped shape modern television. But to fully understand the impact that Dumont made on the television industry, we've got to go 89 years in the past, to 1931. 1931 continued to see financial hardship as the Great Depression wore on. But in Upper Montclair, New Jersey, something big was about to happen. Alan Balcom Dumont had a thousand dollars and a dream. Dumont founded what would come to be known as Dumont Laboratories by producing cathode ray tubes out of his home. Television wasn't widely popular yet. In fact, there were only 15 experimental stations operating through the new medium of mechanical television by the end of the 1920s. Dumont Laboratories didn't only just produce cathode ray tubes. What it began to manufacture before television sets was the oscillograph, which tested electrical equipment. The oscillograph proved to be successful for Dumont as it was a popular instrument for university and government research laboratories. The demand for oscillographs soon turned a profit for Dumont, who moved Dumont Laboratories from his home to manufacturing and research facilities. This led to an important partnership for Dumont in 1935, when he teamed up with investor Mortimer Lowy to formally incorporate Dumont Laboratories. Lowy, pictured here, continued to invest in Dumont for the next 18 years. Two years later, in 1937, Dumont shifted his focus from oscillographs and cathode ray tubes to the blossoming American television industry. Across the Atlantic, in England, the British Broadcasting Corporation had already started to experiment with their own live programs. The BBC formally launched on November 2, 1936. Dumont, on the other hand, would not make its first official broadcast until August 15, 1946, almost an entire decade later. So, what happened in between those 10 years? In simple terms, the onset of World War II brought the world to a standstill, bringing experimental television to a halt in the process. Eight years prior to the first Dumont broadcast, in the summer of 1938, Dumont was approached by Paramount Pictures, a major player in the film industry at this point. Paramount wanted to invest in Dumont, and they did, giving Dumont a grand total of $200,000, worth over $3 million today. Paramount was also able to be a huge influence on Dumont, as they were able to create a new class of stock within the company, Class B. Paramount bought all of this Class B stock, which allowed them to have a say in who got elected to certain powers of position within Dumont. Paramount didn't only just want to invest in Dumont. It was all part of a plan to become a major player in the television industry. Paramount had already failed to establish a lasting partnership with CBS back in 1932. If they were to get anywhere with television, they would have to find another way in. And that way was Dumont. This obsession that Paramount seemed to have, this desperate need to be part of the fledgling television industry, it would all eventually lead to Dumont's downfall by the mid-50s. Leading up to America's involvement in the war, Dumont had obtained a license to construct an experimental station in the spring of 1940. This experimental station's call numbers were W2XWV, but would eventually be changed to WABD in 1944. W2XWV in the summer of 1943 was optimistic about the future of television. On Wednesdays, 
Curious advertisers could come into the studio to experiment for commercial purposes, all for free. Sponsors jumped at the idea of free airtime and quickly got to work at producing the predecessors to today's commercials. These advertisers aired a wide variety of material, including short cartoons and a sponsored news program that used product pitches on air. After the war, on April 15, 1946, Dumont took the next steps to bring television out of its infancy by presenting their new studios on air. These studios were situated in the auditorium of a department store in Manhattan. New York City's mayor and New Jersey's governor were in attendance for the telecast, which included short speeches to inaugurate Dumont's vision for television, a dance routine, a quiz show, and a play. Network television was finally here, and it was here to stay. Dumont's first program is thought to be Serving Through Science, which premiered on June 18, 1946. Other early Dumont shows include Cash and Carry and Play the Game, both game shows. The sport of boxing was another major draw for Dumont. In the fall of 1946, Dumont began broadcasting matches from Jamaica Arena in New York. In coming years, Dumont would broadcast matches from the Eastern Parkway and the St. Nicholas Arenas. Another early Dumont program would create a whole new genre of television, one that still exists and is beloved by its community today. This show was Far Away Hill and the genre was soap opera, although it didn't abide by the same rules soap operas do today. Far Away Hill aired in prime time, as the daytime market had not formally been established yet. Unfortunately, Far Away Hill didn't last very long. It only ran for 12 weeks from October 2nd to December 18th, 1946. 1947 saw the introduction of Small Fry Club, a program targeted towards children. The show quickly became popular with its audience, who rapidly joined the Small Fry Club through membership cards during the four years it was broadcast. Bob Emery, or Big Brother Bob, as he would come to be known as, had started the club on radio in the 1920s and would host the Small Fry Club until 1951. 1947 also marked the premiere of the first official televised sitcom, Mary Kay and Johnny. The sitcom revolved around real-life married couple, Mary Kay and Johnny Stearns. Mary Kay and Johnny saw a few firsts. The sitcom was the first to show pregnancy and the first to have a married couple share a bed, which quickly became taboo after the show went off the air in 1950. Dumont experimented with nightly news broadcasts, and the first of which, the Walter Compton News, was short-lived. However, it was the first news program to air from Washington, D.C. The next attempt at news was Camera Headlights, which ran from January 1948 to 1949. It alternated with INS Telenews, another news program. It's important to note that by 1948, the FCC had decided that it was best to place a freeze on issuing new television stations. The rate at which licenses were being requested was rapid, which led to the freeze in the fall of 1948. The freeze spelled trouble for Dumont because the FCC did not want a fourth major network in the mix. The next attempt at a fourth major network would not see the light of day until the 1980s when Fox came onto the scene in late 1986. Another long-running show for Dumont was OK Mother, which made its debut on November 1, 1948. It was hosted by Dennis James, who was a commentator for Dumont's boxing and wrestling matches. OK Mother was a daytime variety show that was targeted towards mothers. It ran for three seasons, ending on July 6, 1951. Perhaps Dumont's most recognizable show would come to fruition in the summer of 1949 in the form of Captain Video and his Video Rangers. It was a space-themed children's show that ran until 1955 when the majority of Dumont's programs were dropped as the network began to be shut down. Captain Video was one of the most popular children's shows of its time. At one point, it was only eclipsed by the popularity of Howdy Doody. Captain Video truly was an innovative show that could have been much more than it ended up being, even 71 years later. Cavalcade of Stars was another hit for Dumont, 
which ultimately thrust its third host, Jackie Gleason, into the spotlight in the early 1950s. It was a variety show which featured guests such as Jackie Robinson and Dizzy Gillespie. By 1951, though, the show was more focused on skits performed by Gleason. One of these sketches would become the ever-so-popular The Honeymooners, which stayed with Cavalcade of Stars until the show's cancellation in 1952, when Gleason moved his show over to CBS. The Maury Amsterdam show might have originated on CBS, but it was on Dumont that it became a hit when it moved over in the spring of 1949. The sitcom featured Amsterdam as MC at a fictional nightclub, the Silver Swan Cafe. The Maury Amsterdam show ran for 18 months, eventually coming to an end in the fall of 1950. In 1950, Dumont broke the racial barrier when they premiered The Hazel Scott Show. It was one of the first shows to be hosted by an African-American woman, Hazel Scott. Scott, who was a jazz singer, would sing songs in the 15-minute program. The Hazel Scott show was axed only a few short weeks into its run, mainly due to her name being mentioned in an anti-communist publication. Without a sponsor, the show was swiftly canceled on September 29, 1950. Another breakout show in 1950 was Rocky King Detective. Rocky King was a police drama revolving around King, the chief of homicide. Since the show was live, flubbed lines and miscues were common. A meager budget also added some constraints, but Rocky King took those negatives and flipped them around. The show starred Roscoe Carnes as the titular character and ran for four years, drawing to a close at the end of 1954. In 1951, Dumont went where no other network at the time would go with the premiere of The Gallery of Madame Luzon. Anna Mae Wong, a former silent film star, starred in the short-lived show, marking the first time any Asian American played the lead in a television show. The Gallery of Madame Luzon ran for 10 episodes before ultimately getting canned. Another notable show premiering in 1951 was What's the Story? It was a quiz show, with the object of the show being to identify world events. What's the Story was the last non-sports program to air on Dumont, ending on September 23, 1955. No one expected Life is Worth Living to be a runaway hit when it made its debut at the start of 1952. A religious show focusing on morality, Bishop Fulton J. Sheen preached to more than 10 million viewers every week. Life is Worth Living was quite possibly Dumont's most successful program in its 10-year history. Fulton J. Sheen was the only Dumont star to ever win an Emmy, taking home the most outstanding television personality in 1952. When Dumont began to fold in 1955, Life is Worth Living moved to ABC, airing its final Dumont program on April 26th of the same year. Remember Paramount's involvement with Dumont? By 1953, it was becoming blatantly clear that Dumont wouldn't be able to survive much longer. Dumont's competitor, ABC, saw this and offered Dumont a merger, which would allow Dumont to stay afloat. Paramount struck that idea down, leaving Dumont to virtually crumble away into nothingness within the next two years. The quantity of Dumont's shows slowly but steadily dwindled over 1953 and 1954, and by September 1955, Dumont had nothing. They had sold their Pittsburgh station, WDTV, for a whopping $9.75 million to Westinghouse Broadcasting that same January. The sale of the station, paired with the FCC freeze and the loss of their few breakout stars, such as Jackie Gleason, led to Dumont's downfall. Stiff competition from the powerhouses of NBC and CBS didn't help matters either. There was just no coming back from something like this. Dumont reluctantly folded in 1955, leaving popular shows like Life is Worth Living and Captain Video to finish their runs that April. The summer of 1955 consisted of inexpensive programs like It's Alec Templeton Time, and on September 23, 1955, What's the Story was the final program to air on the near-defunct network. So, what was the final program to air on Dumont? Almost 10 years to the date of its first official broadcast, Dumont, or what was left of it, 
quietly signed off for good with a boxing match broadcasted from St. Nicholas Arena on August 6, 1956. Dumont was innovative for its time, but in the end, it just couldn't keep up with what NBC, CBS, or even ABC had to offer. Dumont created the first soap opera, was the first network to establish a daytime schedule, and even televised live NFL games in primetime before any other network did. But it was obvious that the other players in the television game did not want a fourth network crowding the airwaves, and so Dumont faded away into obscurity. A few hundred grainy kinescopes are the remains of Dumont's programming. The rest of it lies in the upper New York Bay, where it was swiftly dumped into the water in the 70s. Losing almost the entirety of Dumont's programming leaves many questions for the entry. What would a show titled The Big Idea have to offer? What about The Family Genius? These are just two examples of Dumont's shows entirely lost for good. Even if the kinescopes were to ever be recovered, it is highly unlikely that the contents will be able to be restored. The Rise and Fall of Dumont is a story full of triumph and bitter, bitter defeat. A great idea turned into reality was hindered by financial instability and brutal competition from the other established networks of the time. Perhaps another factor played a role in Dumont's downfall. Dumont did not have a radio presence like CBS, NBC, and, to a lesser extent, ABC did. They couldn't bring over any well-known stars or series to bridge the gap between radio and television. Dumont has faded into obscurity altogether since it went off the air almost 65 years ago. Fleeting memories from the children of the 40s and 50s are all that is left. What little we have left of Dumont is leaving us in bits and pieces as the years pass us by. Dumont has always been overlooked, and it's time for it to get the recognition it deserves. If Dumont had been established in the age of cable, it probably could have held its own. Maybe Dumont could have thrived as a streaming service. We will never know if Dumont would have been successful or not in today's climate. Either way, Dumont was way ahead of the television game, and it's a shame it never got to see the same levels of success as the big three. Thanks for, wa for watching the inaugural video on my channel. I've linked the sources I used in the description if you'd like to read more about Dumont. The next video in this series is about the WB the next attempt at a fifth national network.